Hi, welcome to the next episode of the Strategist Playbook. In this episode, we're looking at a common client problem. Why leads are declining on my website? Um, Josh, would you like to start this one? Give some general overview. Yeah, uh, for sure. Um, does it really matter if leads are declining on your website? I feel like I spent my MO just throwing it straight back to you guys. I think so. Do you think? So my, 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 uh, my common response to web leads are declining is always, well, give me a million quid and I'll give you another million leads. Just throw it onto PPC ads. Absolutely so you're fine. claiming that you can generate leads at a pound a lead for any claim? Don't hold me to that, Sam. Disclaimer. <laughs> give me some money, throw it on PPC, and I'll give you some more leads. It's not a problem. The, the value of leads is irrespective. Well, the it's, quality of my leads are declining. The quality of, of leads is obviously very important. It's who you attract into your website that's ultimately important. It doesn't matter if you've got 100 leads, 10 leads, if they turn into customers, that's the important thing. So it's about attracting the right people and the right leads. Obviously, if you, if you are attracting the right leads already and you're starting to see a decline from there, then obviously that becomes definitely a problem. And it's one I guess you have to start by investigating using the tools you've got available. Sam, you use these tools every day, like what kind of things do you do to investigate? Yeah, so <clears throat> similar to sessions, obviously I'd start with HubSpot. So obviously in HubSpot we're talking about new contacts, which is the same as leads. Um, looking at various sources of leads, so you know, where are they coming from? And I, I kind of agree with you, yeah, the quality matters and if they are declining it might not be an issue. So the first thing to be found out would be, is it an issue? But assuming that it is, and let's say that you know, you're talking about your pipeline and you, the amount of leads goes on to MQLs, SQLs, and you're declining rapidly, you would be potentially worried about that. So yeah, I would have a look in HubSpot first or a similar tool to sort of find out which channels were driving the most leads and which, for what reason off. that they're dropping off. Yeah, so obviously most commonly, I think when we talk about it, we're talking about organic leads. Um, you know, we've got direct leads, we've got uh, leads coming from social, whatever, but they're usually the biggest source of them will be your organic traffic. Um, I think aside from that though, it's thinking about your website more than anything. Um, you know, what are the conversion points you've got on your website? Usually when we start with like a newish client who's quite new to inbound or new to digital marketing, yeah. they'll have the very basic, they'll have a contact page, one contact page, that's where any leads come through. It's a catch-all form that's gonna say, give us all your details, tell us what you want from us and we'll get someone to get back in touch with you and that's what they call a lead. Obviously what we wanna look at then is, you know, where else can we capture leads and where can we nurture them from? So I think the first thing that I do is sort of have a look through the content audit, whether I've done it or someone else has done it. Is there any high value content on there that's gonna, that could potentially generate some new leads? Yeah. Um, you know, is there an ebook you have, and I know we don't like ebooks, that gets a lot of downloads but isn't gated currently, that kind of thing, or have you got a really high value blog post that you could have like a subscription form on, that kind of thing. Um, just making sure, doing a full website audit almost of, where the potential conversion points are, what you've got at the moment, and making it a little bit. And making sure that the calls to actions are, are the right ones for that for that page. If you're reading a blog or mm -hmm. a web page, and the you know the, the call to action isn't relevant to the page, I don't know it sounds obvious, but mm -hmm. we have seen examples of where you know the content, mm -hmm. the call to action could be more relevant. Mm -hmm. I think. Yeah, like, I had an example recently where someone who I used to work with before I was at Digital Twenty Two back in my content writing days got in touch and said, "Oh, you the blog post you wrote." Was highest source of traffic. He was really excited about this. I was like, oh great, like, do you get many leads through it? And he was like, well no, how would I? And I was like, if you're getting all this traffic to this one blog post, this big long form blog post, why don't you think about creating you know, an ebook or a download off the back of it, have that as your call to action yeah. at the bottom. And it's thinking in terms of that, like, you know, it's great getting traffic, like we talked about in the last episode, but you know, loads of traffic to one blog, which they then drop off is, is as useful as a chocolate fire guard. So it's thinking about you know what pages are getting this traffic and how can we then capture these leads that are hitting this page? How can we get take another step? Why do you, why do you think the leads would have dropped in the first place? So I guess the original mm -hmm. challenge is well leads are declining. Not how do we create more of them? Let's right. say you got a one. Let's say you got a ten page website. It's got a contact form and it. it was generating twenty a month. It's working fine. It didn't need more content. If you're happy with that number, why would it then start declining? Is my question? I guess. We just jump into like, well, how do we create more leads and stuff? Well, why would it start yeah. declining in the first place? Um, I suppose you'd 
for that you'd look at your pipeline and you'd look at I know we spoke about in the last episode but if sessions have dropped you know and your conversion rate stays the same then quite naturally you're going to be getting less contact mm. off the back of that um, so you know for that you'd go back and watch episode one of how you could boost your sessions but um, yeah that'd be one of the most common reasons that I would see Generations. quality quality become, um, it'd be content as well I think if you're not producing that right kind of like level of content pitched at the right audience you know I th- you're going to see I think drop off in in contacts this is I'm not going to submit my information on this page for if I don't think this is you know the right type of content and mm-hmm. for not providing the right value for me I don't think how long do you think that degradation takes? So when we talk about inbound, we always love to show these graphs where contents in, and sessions are increasing exponentially. What point does somebody stop creating content or stops expanding their website? Does that start to trend down again? Mm, I think that's a how long's a piece of string question, really, isn't it? You know, how long does it take for a piece of content to decay? How long does it stay relevant for? If you're creating content pieces that are like oh, 2020 trends for example, in X industry, then that's probably got a year life cycle, but potentially two people will tend to read those sort of articles like a year later, but four years from now, no one's Googling something and clicking on an article that's got 2020 written on it. Yeah, look at the, the keyword trends as well, if they're, if they're tailing off and that particular page or blog has got that, you know, it's focused on that particular keyword or theme then, and it's on a downward trend, then you'll see less sessions and less, as a result, less contacts. Mm-hmm. Makes sense. The other thing, oh, on. Sorry, I was no, just going to say, the other thing is that your conversion rate could have dropped for whatever reason, so you might be getting the same level of sessions that you always did, but if you're getting less contacts to me, that's going to suggest that for some reason that conversion rate is starting to decrease, um, therefore even if you increase sessions, you've got a, a bit of a leak in the middle there, and uh, you know, just increasing sessions isn't necessarily going to fix your problem if you've got a slowly decreasing conversion rate. Cool, makes sense. So identify why. Quite often it'll be because of degrading keywords or degrading content, make sure you stem in that flow and then look at ways of increasing your leads through things like content. Mm-hmm. Okay, cool. You know, one thing I find a lot of our customers don't do as well, which is a really good lead magnet, but it's kind of not a direct lead magnet, it's, it's almost like a, a false indicator in the system because you don't really see it, is they don't tend to focus on their existing customers mm-hmm. as lead opportunities. Because they're already in the system, they don't come up as leads, they just come up as customers. A lot of our clients don't ever focus on that journey. I think that's really important as well because we know customers are the easiest ones to cross-sell, the easiest ones to upsell against, the ones with long-standing relationships. You've already got that connection with them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so one of the things I always tell our, our clients is don't worry too much about the raw lead numbers. Make sure you're also thinking about your existing customer journey as well and making sure that's optimised. You've got your emails in place, yeah. you've got the right connections with the sales teams because that's a really good source of leads even though it might not appear that way in the system. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, that's a really good point. I think talking about this, and this applies to new leads and existing leads, is still thinking about conversion rate optimization. It's one of those services that we offer, but a lot of people still don't do it. You know, they, they focus on generating new leads and generating new sessions and just keep filling that top of the funnel as much as possible, but they're not thinking as much about, you know, the journey afterwards. Those like, are already engaged. Yeah. So you, we could have clients that could be, you could say, oh, I've got 10,000 sessions to this, and they, this page, and they'd be happy about that. But what's not being thought of is then, the traffic's going to this page, like, are you then taking them on a journey? Is it easy for them to convert, or to take a next step where they might convert? And obviously, all things being well and your traffic's healthy, you want to be thinking about how I convert the biggest portion of that traffic, especially the relevant sections of that traffic. The, 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 um the information you're asking for, I find, is a really big one that mm-hmm. people don't tend to think about or they do it in a really bad way. So if you create an awareness piece of content, and obviously you have to be thinking about those terms, is this awareness-based, consideration or decision-based? They'll create an awareness piece of content so very early in the in the buying journey. And ask 50 questions. But then they'll ask 50 <laughs> questions. They'll want your name, your company name, your email address, how many kids you've got, what school they're at. Ridiculous. What's your star sign? <laughs> start off with just the basics. You're not going to sell anything to somebody at the start of the journey anyway. Mm-hmm. Just get their email address, just get them into the system and then use automation tools like email or paid retargeting to take them on that journey. Then as you go, you start to collect more information mm-hmm. about them. But yeah, so I always find that's a really big part for people. Mm-hmm. I know I don't do it. If I see a form on a website and he wants to know my address or my phone number, 
and it's a not optional field, I'm not filling in that form. <laughs> Unless I'm ready to make a buying decision. Mm-hmm. I think the pers- personalised content as well, personalised pages, both some kind of like the previous, you know, um, what they've been looking at on the site, you can present them with kind of like a certain amount of, or mm-hmm. certain types of, of information that will be personalised to them, so they're more likely, I think, to, mm-hmm. to fill in that form and, and give you their and give you their contact details. Mm-hmm. If you can actually, yeah, personalise the journey, and you know, tools like HubSpot will help you do that. Yeah, definitely. I think, um, obviously, the key here is to make sure that you're creating content throughout that buyer's journey, each with a form that's more progressive than the last, where you yeah. know, the more valuable the piece of content, the more information we feel that we deserve for that. Uh, but it's also a case of promoting that content. You know, it's easy to create. Well, it's not easy, but to create a, a guide or an ebook or something that's valuable to that audience. But unless they can find it, it's it's not going to generate leads. And you know, I've seen it time and again. Where, oh, we've got all these great downloads, but no one downloads. And I'm like, all right, well, have you seeded them on social? Have you seeded them on email? Have you? created a, a lead flow or a pop-up, as most people might call it, you know, to let people on the website know we've got this great download here, very relevant to you, come and download it. So, you know, if they sit on a landing page, aside from the website, they're not easy to navigate to. They're very unlikely to potentially rank highly in SERPs. So it's how you're gonna seed that piece of content, how you're gonna make sure that a steady stream of traffic comes through to it. And usually, obviously, we create things like high value blog posts that we can link through which is a good tactic, we'd use lead flows and pop-ups, we'd send them out on email, uh, make sure we constantly see them on social, just to make sure that the traffic's going to the pages that are going to convert people into leads, not just your homepage or you know your service pages. 100%. I've got a client right now that loves to ask us to create landing pages and always ask, how do I rank really high for that landing page? How do I get thousands of people to that landing page? But they don't want to create any other assets around it, they just want to create the landing page. Mm-hmm. Of course, you're right, you need all that stuff around it as well. And even just taking that content and splitting it out, like I think we mentioned in episode one, take an ebook, take a guide, a checklist, a calculator, whatever it is, and turn it into other formats of content. Mm-hmm. So it could be social snippets, you could take out some quotes and testimonials if it's a brochure, and um, you could turn it into video, mm-hmm. and all that helps with like, social media and the promotion of it mm-hmm. as well. Yeah. I think that's really important. I think that gets missed quite a lot as well. They just take a guy and like, okay, yeah, let's just let's just throw mm-hmm. it on social and the people will come. We send it to a massive email list hoping for the best. Exactly. Yeah. A bit more thought out, I think, doesn't it? Yeah. I think that's one of the top topic kind of landing pages in general. I mean when we talk about leads, ninety percent of the time they're coming through a landing page and I suppose you could argue even a contact page is almost like a landing page where you might send someone or a book a demo mm-hmm. page or whatever it might be for whatever company. Um, you know, I've seen some really, really bad ones. So one of the other things I'd do is maybe review all of the landing pages. And I think for best practice, I mean, I've seen some that've got chapter and verse content. The whole point of the landing page is to give that really light touch. You know, for me, two paragraphs, three max. If you've got to really get a point, maybe a video. Maybe a video. Very good idea. Um, and just make sure that all your landing pages are optimized to convert. You know, I mean, when we do them, we, we even take off the, the top navigation quite often just to make sure that it's a really simple journey. There's not all sorts of different clickable elements going on. There's just keep, it, just keep it simple and yeah. remove any other distractions, maybe on the landing page or the blog page or the, yeah. the web page and just focus on that mm-hmm. one topic content rather than sign up for a newsletter or whatever it might yeah. be. Mm-hmm. Just keep it focused on that one call to action. Just that's the. Yeah, that's what the goal is to get them to convert on that page so they mm-hmm. try and take them away from it. Yeah, clients have like a heart attack when you talk about getting rid of the menu navigation. Oh, how are they going to get to our home page or about us page? That's obviously not the point. You mm-hmm. just want them, you're right, you just want to get to do that one thing, download that piece of content, mm-hmm. get them in as a lead, and then you can see them that information after. Mm-hmm. If they really want to get to your home page, they'll be able to get there without mm-hmm. too much difficulty anyway. So, yeah, that makes sense. I agree. I think on some of the, you know, the, the, um, the crow audits that we do, Conversion rate optimization. There's different things you can, you know, look at at pages. Heat maps, for example, where um, your visitors and are, are actually clicking on that page, so you can see where, you know, if it, if they aren't clicking here, maybe move the call to action at, at a different place, or just have a reformat of, of that page, or looking where, yeah, where could potential contacts aren't looking and are looking, and then maybe do an A/B test as well on a different page, just see which ones kind of convert the best. Yeah, I think that's a common problem with a lot of new clients and a lot of websites I've seen. I think for some reason in people's heads like the narrative of any web page is 
content, 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 content. And then the final thing you ask for is the form. For some reason, people see the form as the conclusion. Therefore, nine times out of 10, when you start with a new client, you sort of see, you scroll down the service pages and at the very bottom, hidden under fold after fold is this form. And it's like you're assuming that people are going to come on, read every piece of information on this page, get that far down and then convert. The reality is, as we know, that most people will barely scroll on a page. So, mm. you know, if possible, can the form be above the fold? Some people are just looking to submit an inquiry anyway. They don't really want all the information. Some people might want to scroll down and read it all, but you know, it's getting that into people's heads that you can have two forms on a page. You could have one above the fold, and you could have one at the, the footer of the page. And just making it really easy for people to convert. I think there's a lot of examples of websites out there where they're, we're not getting enough leads, and it's like, well, you've made an assault course for people, essentially, to work through before they're even allowed to give you the contact details. You've not made it easy mm-hmm. enough. Well, same, same thing with blogs too, right? You, mm-hmm. We see perhaps we've done this in the past as well, as always putting the CTA at the very, very bottom of the blog post. It's okay to put it in the middle if it's a mm-hmm. template or it's relevant to a particular section in the content. Yeah, and just to try and test different different ways of doing things as well, is there a better option than a form? Um, could we use strategically placed pop-ups or you know the banners at the top of the page rather than a rather than a, a pop-up form? Sometimes you'll, you'll read a couple of lines and the, mm-hmm. download the content, the form will pop up. Yeah. So you immediately have not read the content yet, yeah. close it down, and then mm-hmm. you maybe lost that opportunity, you've got to scroll all the way to the bottom for them to see the form. Sure. Maybe video, just, video, sorry, go on. Yeah, I'm just saying maybe just have that, maybe like a banner at the top of the page that's always available to, for you to come um, download that piece of content. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Video, I was going to say, video is the same. Um, people think, well, you can't convert on video. But you've got tools like uh, Vidyard or Wistia mm-hmm. that allow you to put forms directly in the video, either like halfway, it's a really valuable piece of content. You want to almost lock it and gate it, and you can just ask for the email address to continue watching yeah. the video, or at the very end, adding the CTA to the next content piece. So you don't have to watch the video, read the blog, get right to the bottom, and then convert. Mm-hmm. You just do it right there within the video. And obviously, we know videos really up and trend. Well, it's trendy right now, isn't it? Is a content form, and it's only going to get trendier. Yeah, I think the form itself as well. I mean, HubSpot do a really good job of this, as you would expect them to, but. They don't ever present you with a really long form to fill out, but quite often they'll use like a multi-step form, and you know it's giving you a bit of information, almost gamifies you through the system. Um, I know we've also got a multi-step form that we have in our marketplace that works great, um, but it's that whole when someone's presented with a massive amount of information to input, they're like, mm, is it worth it? Whereas if you were to piece it up a little bit and make sure it, you know, flows them through and gives them a reason to get through then it becomes more valuable. People are almost like, well, I've started it now, so I'm going to have to finish it, which isn't as off-putting in the first place. 100%. Another example similar to that is uh, chatbots. Mm-hmm. Uh, so like with Drift, or again, HubSpot has the, the functionality too. Having a chatbot on your site that, that's designed to support with those conversions. So a chatbot could be many things. It could be like, it could be informational, it could be navigational, it's just trying to help you get where you need mm-hmm. to go, or it could be converted. It could be all three in one, to be fair. But it could be converting where it asks for your name, your email address, you might have a question that it helps answer, and mm-hmm. then at the end of that conversation it might say, hey, we've identified this content might be really val- valuable for you, mm-hmm. or this is where you need to go next to mm-hmm. continue your journey. And just use that stepped approach to have a fairly mm-hmm. organic conversation and try and convert them that way mm-hmm. as well. So we find chatbots work really well these days, and mm-hmm. again, that's kind of an up and coming thing, particularly with services like Drift that have AI built in, so mm-hmm. they can have these very complex workflows designed to create that very organic conversation. Yeah, good idea. Mm-hmm. Experimenting with different types of forms as well, like similar to that, we've got different forms for like book a meeting. Works in some industries, not not, not all, but if you're someone who's happy for meetings to be booked in with you without having to sort of okay them first, you can use like HubSpot tools like that to sort of give me your details, we'll book a meeting into someone's calendar for you. And that's getting you that contact detail and also getting you a conversation with the client. It's, you know, it's the whole lessons of inbound is let them come to us rather than us having to go to them all the time. Makes sense. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah I agree. Uh, one of the other good features um, that I use a lot in HubSpot as well to, to measure how much impact these different elements are having on the buyer mm-hmm. journey is um, attribution reports, mm-hmm. which are really helpful because they give you different <coughs> models where you can see how much impact has 
this form or this page or this campaign had on converting that user through. Mm. You can even go further down into actual titles of blogs or yeah, exactly. individual yeah, download mm-hmm. has had a, the best impact and on the on the journey before coming a lead or a sales qualified lead. Yeah, so you really see what the conversion points are and how they've supported the user journey. So that's a good way of testing, I guess, some of the, some of the suggestions we're making here. Mm along with the A-B testing and multivariate testing, use attribution reporting as well to see how much value did this add to the, the content creation journey. It's just so you know where to focus, yeah. I suppose, your, your efforts in the future. It's working, mm-hmm. keep doing more of that. I think the one thing we haven't touched on a lot is paid leads. Um, obviously, you know, you talk, we're talking all about organic leads and how you bring in the traffic and convert it into a lead. Now, more and more, I know all of my clients, most of my clients are using um, like LinkedIn lead gen adverts, which we found to be really effective. I know you've got your pros and cons to it. <laughs> no, it's, uh, ex- it's expensive, but it works. It's expensive. I think it works really well for clients that have a high value proposition, high value product or a service, because you know when you talk about LinkedIn ads and someone says, oh, it's 50 pound per lead, that's pretty cheap for LinkedIn. So if you're selling like, something that's you know quite low value and you're looking for volume probably not the tool no. for you but in terms of generating you know large-scale b2b leads it's quite an effective tool and we always say to clients you know yeah there's not you know your organic leads might be down but give us x amount of budget and we can bring in x amount of leads or there or thereabouts and that's always an option um you know we can also tailor the audience then so you know you're going to get relevant Relevant yeah, contact from a relevant lead. audience from your target industry, even as far as going, tell us the 100 companies that you'd love to work with, and we'll target the job titles of the people you want to speak to at those companies. So I think it's a really effective tool for generating leads, especially short term leads when you can't necessarily wait the six to nine months for all the organic stuff to happen. And there's work going on in the background to optimize the website and create new content that can always be a really good source of traffic. Look, traffic look, source look traffic like audiences too. Look like audiences too, right? So you take a subset of your existing customer mm-hmm. base that you know is right for mm-hmm. you and what you do. Pop into LinkedIn, expand it out to a look like audience, mm-hmm. target that group as well. Yeah. Um, but I know it, it depends a lot on the type of content too, doesn't it? So mm-hmm. if it's a guide or a brochure or an inbound piece of content, mm-hmm. like a checklist or a template, something like that, they work really well on mm-hmm. LinkedIn. Yeah. Then if it's a more generic business ad that you're trying mm-hmm. to sell your services or just create brand awareness, mm-hmm. that's when things like Google Ads still works quite well. Mm-hmm. Display network can get a lot of traffic. Results can vary, but again, different networks for different mm-hmm. things. Yeah, I think the other, the other thing that works really well with the LinkedIn ads is though that it uses the LinkedIn data to populate the form. So if people don't even have to fill in the form. It almost, you click on the thing, here's your detail, just press submit and obviously opt into marketing preferences. And it, it's there, so it's really it's like accessible. Yeah. It's it's low touch for someone. It's almost like click click. We've generated a lead. You've got the content piece, and no one had to do anything really. What do you think about Facebook and Twitter, Sam? Uh, in the right markets, yeah. Uh, Twitter, I always think of as a good source of relatively cost effective traffic rather than leads. So you know, if depends you on the industry, I suppose. Yeah, depending on the industry, but brand awareness wise, you know, Twitter can be great. Facebook tends to be, for me, more B2C audience. Obviously, we don't work with a great deal of B2C clients. We've got a couple, but the majority of the time we're working with B2B, which is why you sort of default to a little bit LinkedIn. LinkedIn. Cool. Cool. I agree. I think every channel has its place, depending on their objectives or the type of content, Mm -hmm. the the goals and audience type. Mm -hmm. Go see the uh, paid media podcast for more information. <laughs> <laughs> Link here. Cool. So we talked about why leads decrease. We talked about stemming it and looking at things like conversion rate optimization to stop that fall. And then talked about different channels, depending on where people are coming from, how to actually start increasing those leads, whether it's through more content, or it's through the way that CTAs are placed on the page, yeah. and making sure it's fully optimized to that buyer journey to get the right quality leads. And then I guess the next step then comes converting those uh, converting those leads into actual marketing qualified leads. Once they're in the system, how do you then move them on to the next step of the buyer journey? Which so I'm smiling, I feel like that's gonna be <laughs> episode number three. I think it might so be, yeah. stay tuned. In episode three, we'll be talking about how to convert leads into MQLs, SQLs, and make sure you're filling out the rest of the marketing pipeline. Thank you very much guys. Cheers. Thanks so for watching. Thanks for watching.